You're listening to the Maritime Gardening Podcast, episode 129, brought to you by Vessi Seeds and Safer's Gardening Products. Today, folks, we've got author, teacher, master gardener, blogger, YouTuber, Mythbuster, speaker of truth, Robert Padlis, <laughs> fresh off his new book called Plant Science. And he's got another book almost about to be his new, new book. Robert, it's been a while. Say hello and tell us what you've been up to. Well, hello, everybody. Um, well, what have I been up to? Uh, it's been a long summer that's really dry, so I learned how to garden with less water, <laughs> um, just because you had to. Um, and, you know, I keep writing. Lots, there's lots and lots of stuff out there that's wrong, so I got to go and correct it all, so I <laughs> I never run out of mess to write about. So, and today we're we're talking about your book, uh, Plant Science, um, and I'm going to be asking Robert questions about this book. I've I've just I'm I'm we're going to do two part. This is going to be a two parter because I can't get it through everything I want to ask him about this book. I don't think in one episode here, but you just wrote another book. What's that one called? Well, the new one is Compost Science for Gardeners. And it covers, you know, traditional composting as well as some of the unusual things like bokashi and worm composting, wormy compost, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and then we even have a few weird things in there. And, and we talk about the processes, how to do it, what not to do, and why it works. Right. So, yeah. And you said, so that, that book is written and it's coming out. Yes. Right. So, and you're you're working on another one. Well, see, the, it's a long cycle. So that one I finished writing around the December of last year. Wow. And I won't see it for another three weeks. And I'm currently writing the next book, which is microbe science for gardeners. And so, so I'm, I'm, you know, there's always a few books in, in, in the hopper. And this one I won't probably see for a year before like once i'm finished writing it i'll submit it and it'll take a year before i see the printed copy right so yeah so it's a whole series of uh books on science for gardeners <laughs> well speaking of science uh so you've you've written let's just run through the names these titles of the books that are this science and that science you've got um soil science Boy. Right, I'll, I'll let you, why don't you tell me what they are? <laughs> Soil science, plant science, compost science, microbe science, and eventually there'll be a food science one, which food would science. be quite interesting. Yeah. That so. would be, uh, actually, I just, uh, that's, that's fascinating because I was just, you know, I, I just wrote an article on why I like cooked kale as opposed to raw kale. Mm -hmm. And I had a home economics teacher on my podcast a number of months ago fascinating lady she's like i don't know in her late 70s i think she'd been doing this her whole life and she was talking about how like there's this view that cooked food is less nutritious than yeah. than raw food and she was saying it's not entirely i mean in, in some cases there are things that are destabilized by cooking but there are other things that are actually more like available to us by cooking like you know we can digest them better and there's some things like calcium that aren't affected at all by it, you know, in the slightest, but people will, will just view the cooking as it, as an overall omnibus depletion. Yeah. Um, and I'm actually on the, in the process of just doing an article on kale cooked versus raw. Mm -hmm. And I got to write an entire, in my Substack page, like an entire thousand word article comparing cooked to raw kale mm -hmm. from a nutrition point of view. Right. And the, the relative merits of both approaches, of course, I'm going to I let the cat out of the bag. I think you're better off with the cooked. Uh, but <laughs> You better get the science right. Well, or some, just, some people will comment on their exactly. posts there. <laughs> well, I, got, I made a table in Excel using the USDA, you mm -hmm. know, measurements per, per serving sort of thing. Um, so I had to get pretty fanciful because like a serving of, of raw kale it's a volume right you can only put so much mm -hmm. in you right so sure. you can you're going to eat way more cooked kale than raw kale because raw kale sh gets small right yeah. and cooked kale is more uh, or raw kale is so much fiber more fibrous and big mm -hmm. and so even though i mean the gist of it is that even though the in certain for certain things a raw kale has more per weight you're only going to be eating a fraction 
of the kale that you'd eat cooked. Mm -hmm. It might eat like six times as much cooked kale than raw because it's just so much easier to get into you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like a cup of it, I can't remember what the number was, but like a cup of raw is like 17 grams. And a cup of cooked is like 140 grams. Or, I can't mm -hmm. remember what the number was, but it was something distinct like that. So you're just so much more kale per mm -hmm. volume, right? Um, yeah. Anyway, way off topic. Um, <laughs> what a question I want to ask you is you've written all these books on science. And um, this is something I, I seem to recall you bringing up before where um, you notice a lot of gardening, but there's all kinds of books on gardening. I mean, it's just about but as many gardening books as there is cookbooks, Good you books. know, um, everyone that thinks they know something about it writes a book about it. Um, but they don't all seem to dwell on the science of it. And to me, the, the plant world, the natural world is, is a treasure trove of opportunities for scientific mm -hmm. inquiry. Um, so why do you think it's the case that, I mean, either it's the case that gardening authors aren't that interested in it, or there's a perception that the audience, the readers aren't that interested mm -hmm. in it. What do you, what do you think is going on there? Oh, it's, it's a, it's a combination of things. I mean, what we know about plants all does come from science. And sure, we learn a little bit of, from gardeners who, who are experimenting, but those are mostly ideas that may be true. And right? then science comes along and actually shows either are true or they're not true. The so hypothesis is tested. What, yeah, what we really know all comes from science. The problem is the, the general gardener um, is not that familiar with science, even the scientific process of how do you test something to see if it's valid, right? Um, people, many people do not understand that. Right. And, and that's sort of the, the basics of what science is like. And I think once you understand that, then you, you better appreciate the importance of science as opposed to gardening opinion. Yes. Right? And I, I have arguments with people all the time about this. They say, well, I, I did ABC in the garden and it worked. So I know it's right. Um, until you did con do controls, you actually don't know what no. caused that, right? Um, but there is another problem in, in the written information we have about gardening. And it's not just gardening. I think it's, it's all uh, topics. Um, the, the, a lot of the writers don't actually do and know what they're writing about right right they they research it so so i'm going to write about a new plant that i've never grown so i go and i read some, what somebody else wrote and i regurgitate that information as if it's yes. true i don't go and check the scientific literature about this plant writers don't do that it's too much work um and a lot of that information may not even be there so I read somebody else's work and that other person read, read somebody else's work and, and, and so on. So you'll find these gardening books. They all say the same thing. And they're 90% of them are wrong because they've all copied from each other. Yes. Nobody's gone and looked at the actual science for this thing. That's right. uh, I, I give you an example. We, I, I just did a, a blog video about... Um, sheet mulching where we put down cardboard and we put some mulch on top and uh and that kills the grass and makes a new garden you know, and that that works fine that that's that's a good technique um the the point i was making though was the cardboard after the first year doesn't add anything and yet people want to use cardboard as a mulch year after year because it's so good for soil and the microbes love it and and all this information if you look at the science, you realize there's virtually no nutrients in cardboard. There's nothing in there for dewworms and, and microbes and so on. It's, it's mostly a covering of the grass that kills the grass. And, and after that, it decomposes a little bit. The grass, the grass, uh, the grass is rich. Like, you know, yeah, like the decomposing grass and the roots of the grass, that adds a lot. And the mulch you put on top. You yes. see it's that mulch on top that's actually making your good soil. It's not the cardboard, right? Right. Yeah, the cardboard's um, like you know, I don't know, uh, but you know, if it was a meal, the cardboard's maybe like potatoes or not even potatoes. If you took the nutrition, you know, yeah, there's just not a lot. There's some carbon there. Um, <laughs> yeah, you can find you know a, a thousand gardening books and blogs that will tell you this is a good idea and it it works. 
And uh, yeah, it, it sort of does work. But when you want to look at the science, you have to go back at the cardboard and say, okay, what is the nutrient content of cardboard? And then you realize, well, this isn't adding much to my soil. So the nutrients I'm, I'm getting in there and the improvement of my soil have to be coming from someplace else. And well, all you have left is, is the mulch and the original grass, right? Yeah. Um, but I, I think that many writers... Um, uh, find that a difficult process so so they're regurgitating what they've read before right and that's a problem even on on the internet and in social media and these gardening groups and wherever you're going you know it doesn't matter what social media you're using people are regurgitating information they've heard rather than information that they know to be true yeah right and um so we, you know, we just repeat the same thing over and over and over and over again, right? Have some salt, have some salt, have some salt. Yeah, um, and <laughs> so that's that's the problem. So if we really want to become good gardeners, and I think many gardeners eventually get to that stage, they suddenly realize, well, all this stuff that I thought I knew, I I really don't know, and they start weeding through this and starting to understand it better. And so it's easier to convince more experienced gardeners of the truth as opposed to new gardeners who are relying on what they've read somewhere else. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and it's funny because like, I remember, I don't know if it was you I had on my podcast or another kind of guy like you, um, where one of my viewers said, you know, there's other ways of knowing, right? Um, quite, quite upset because we we're very sciencey kind of guys and we're really having a science fest and uh i mean yeah doing stuff the way your dad did or your your grandmother did or whatever that that's a way of uh, that is a way of knowing but it's not a way of knowing for sure <laughs> you know well, it's it's, it's and different it's, when you're having like double blind tests and experimental design and you're taking the human the human capacity for error out of the figuring out what the actual what's actually going on right, right. and you're yeah. you're also piling skepticism on top of the process maybe i'm wrong like you're you know if you're doing it science if you're taking a scientific approach you're constantly saying am i am i making a mistake am i doing this wrong you're showing it to others do you think i got this wrong you know yeah. that whole communality aspect of it where you you're getting peer reviewed you're getting checked um you're showing people how you did your experiments so they can criticize whether you screwed something up or you made a incorrect uh, conclusion that sort of thing yeah yeah and so it it's not going to change unless <laughs> people read my books so it's, yeah. <laughs> there you go <laughs> well speaking of which let's get let's get into your book um so you know for anyone that's thinking of buying the gardening book for the gardener who has everything or the gardening book for the gardener who has nothing, that is to say, mm -hmm. no books. I think this, I mean, the, the soil science book is a great starting book. Uh, and the plant science book is a great starting book. You could really, you know, it's, that's, that's a Ginger or Marianne uh, proposition for me. <laughs> so how do you decide? Because right? um, they're both, you know, basically, if you have a good understanding of this book or the soil science book, my goodness, I mean, you're, you're way ahead of most people because you're not going to be wasting time doing things that don't make a lot of sense. Uh, and you're going to know a lot. Um, again, I was, I was explaining to Robert just before we called that books like this, I tend to, I read all my books on the toilet and I tend to read them once, um, you know, for the interview, but then I leave them in the bathroom and sort of go, go through them multiple times to really get it almost like a student studying to get it more into my head. Yeah. Um, so what I'm going to do is just, um, you know, as I was reading through the book, I would just sort of like dog ear pages uh, and underlying stuff. I was like, oh, that was interesting. I didn't know that before, right? That sort of thing. Um, so, and it's been a while. How long has it been since you wrote this book? Uh, it's been a year. Okay, yeah. You sent it for me like right on Christmas. I'm getting, it took me this long to get through it. <laughs> um, that's my, I'm, always, I'm always reading about four, you know, four books simultaneously. I've got one book in the upstairs bathroom, one book in the downstairs bathroom. I got one book at work one book in my car because sometimes you're like waiting for something yeah. <laughs> I'm like a book in my car that i'm reading for ages right and the downstairs bathroom i read uh grapes of wrath yeah john okay. steinbeck 
that's one of the best books I ever read. I just finished that. That might, I said to my wife, that's probably the last book I'm ever going to read without reading glasses. Uh, <laughs> 50 years old. <laughs> I started it here and it <laughs> finished it down here somewhere. <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, yeah, we're just, I'm just going to sort of uh, walk through uh, the questions I had or, or more like things I would like you to talk about a little bit for the viewers, for the sake of the viewers, to get them interested in the book. Um, and, uh, and we'll just work our way through and see where we can get uh, in the next uh, hour much time we've gotten, 40 minutes or so. So the first book is just like plant basics, or the first uh, chapter is basics. And so I think we should start at the most basic thing, um, photosynthesis, that thing that makes life on earth possible. So uh, how about you just give us the Coles notes? I mean, everybody thinks they know what photosynthesis is. I remember the first time when I started writing and I decided to write a paragraph explaining photosynthesis. And I think I spent three hours reading <laughs> 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 to try, you know, because I, 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 so I went out of the light and then the leaves and then it's, you know, the stuff happened, you know, plants need light and they make it, you know, but really I didn't understand how fascinating photosynthesis is. So uh, can you expand on that a little bit. Sure. Uh, I think most people understand the basic concepts, right? Um, and the one thing that makes plants special really is photosynthesis. They're, they're one of the few organisms that can take the energy of light, uh, the carbon from CO2, and combine them into new molecules. So the two key things there, one is the carbon molecule and the other one is the energy. So the photosynthesis process creates a bunch of new uh, molecules that have this carbon in it and, and they slowly build up into larger and larger things. So sugar is, is mostly uh, carbon and oxygen and starch is the same thing. They're just different forms of that. But the important thing is that it does have carbon in there and it, it's energy. Right? So we're taking the energy from the sun and, and we're putting in these molecules. And in, in my book, I describe them uh, as sort of little batteries, if you like. Um, the plant is recharging its batteries. And that's what photosynthesis is all about. What I find really fascinating is that if that didn't happen, almost all of the life forms on, on Earth would disappear. Yes. Uh, if you think about it, we, we all need to find this carbon source and we need to find an energy source. And all the mammals and insects, uh, we all live on plants, either directly or indirectly. Yes. Uh, even when we eat a cow, right? The, we think, oh, we're eating meat. But, well, we're, we're really not because the cow ate the grass. So what we're really doing when we eat a cow is we're eating grass, right? It's the grass that photosynthesized and it took that carbon and that energy, put it together into these molecules that we need. And those molecules are the energy that, are, that drives our body. Yes. And we, we don't really think about uh, living forms as sort of this, uh, you know, so being so driven by energy, but we are. Um, everything we put in our mouth, the, the main reason we do that is to get energy out of it. Yes. And when we digest things, we take these big molecules and we slowly break them up into smaller and smaller molecules. But as we're doing that, we're, we're taking little bits of energy out there. And that energy is what allows us to, you know, walk around and eat and stand up and do everything that we do. Without that energy, we couldn't do that. Yeah, um, if I find we, it interesting that when people talk about diet these days they'll talk about protein and vitamins and minerals yeah and you know really it's if you didn't have the energy none of that would matter at all <laughs> none of that that really matters i mean th those are also important they're all right? important yeah. the protein is is adding the nitrogen component and and that's almost as important as the carbon and of course we have some vitamins thrown in there as, as well and we need those as well but uh without the, without the, the energy the rest doesn't matter we, we need that energy. Uh, the one thing that a lot of people don't realize is that plants do the same thing we do. So they photosynthesize to make these compounds, but the body at the same time, the plant body now, is also using these molecules as an energy source. 
So they're taking in oxygen, just like we do. They're taking the sugars, they're digesting those, they're sucking the energy out, and they're producing CO2. So plants are producing CO2 all day long, day and night, and all really? parts of the plant. So whether this is a leaf or a flower or a root, they're all breathing just like us, right? And part of that breathing process is sucking this energy out. You're left with CO2, which we have too much of now. We, we need to get rid of some of that because we, we want the energy part, right? So plants actually do two things. They, they make these chemical compounds, these sugars, and they also use the sugars to get the energy out. Right. Um, now, luckily for plants, they're able to photosynthesize when the sun is up and they're able to make enough sugars that they will survive overnight in the darkness. Not only that, but they make excess so that they're actually able to grow. Right. Um, you know, it's it, almost like I remember reading it thinking it was like when you have a, you know, a, a solar powered device. And it charges during the day, so it can, like, you know, if you had a solar refrigerator, it sort of charge up during the day, and it gets, it's got enough charge to, like, run overnight, maybe run a little bit, maybe, you know, you know, maybe it's always got 36 hours of energy on hand, just in case there's a night that lasts, you know, you have a night with a rainy day the next day or something like that. But it reminded me of that, just that storage capacity. That's right. And, and plants actually use a, a special compound called a, ATP, which yeah. is its, its battery molecule, right? So it, it charges these ATP molecules and they're floating all over the plant. Whenever part of a plant needs some energy, they take that ATP and, and pull that energy out. But they're, they're just like little rechargeable batteries. So the plant is, when the sun is out, is recharging. And you're right, they have to plan for, for instance, perennials, they have to plan for the winter time when there are no leaves, right? Uh, trees, even evergreens in the winter become less active. So in the winter, these evergreens are still photosynthesizing, but very little. And so they have to now build up enough energy and, and that's usually in the form of sugars and starches so that they can survive through the winter until next spring when they make new leaves or it gets warm enough so they can start photosynthesizing again. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, we're going to get to that a bit later on about when we talk about roots, because, you know, the one thing you say in the book is, you know, we, we say the roots are dormant, but they're not, not nothing going on. But we'll talk about that um, in the root section. But yeah, it's like, uh, oh, okay, I thought there was nothing going on. But, yeah. you know, they need energy, right? Because they're not, it's different than a seed, yeah. uh, which is another, there's energy in a seed too, but that's a different thing altogether. Um, now, there's another thing you were talking about in that chapter about um, marismatic cells, which I'd never heard the word before in my life. And it's, it, you know, plants have marismatic cells. Their cells are different than ours. It's, you know, you can cut, cut the arm off a plant. It just grows two arms, you know, and you can remove, you know, there's just a fascinating thing plants can do that we, generally speaking, can't do. Um, we, we can't do. When, when, uh, when humans, when we, fertilization first takes place, there are some cells in there that are essentially marist maristomatic cells. Okay. And, and what that really means is that these are special cells that are able to, to multiply and, and, and reproduce so you get more and more of them, but they're not differentiated, which means they're not a type of cell yet. Not so, a nose so, cell. And, well, a skin cell, for instance, or an eye cell or a hair cell. These are all different kinds of cells, right? And when the embryo is first made, those parts don't exist. <laughs> so at, at some point, they start to differentiate and, and you start seeing skin cells and you start seeing bones and livers and all these other things. Well, the same thing happens in, in a plant. Um, the big difference between the two is that we sort of grow out of that. So by the time we're born, uh, almost all our cells now are, are differentiated and they have a purpose in life. And if you take your, you know, your, your uh, skin cells, 
you, you can't grow livers out of them sort of thing at least yeah. not yet <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, at least not normally you don't yes. do that right liver spots now, perhaps. now science <laughs> science is getting pretty close to being able to do those sorts of things right but, uh you know in general that doesn't happen if you get your finger cut off it doesn't regrow and and so on and the reason is that you don't have mary stomatic cells there there aren't cells that can turn into a new finger right and that's one of the big differences between animals and, and plants. Plants have these special cells in various parts of the, the organism. Uh, and you find them uh, certainly in the root tips of the plants. You yes. find them in the shoots, so they're the top growing points. You find them in the, the axle where the stem and the leaf join together. And if you look at one of those, you'll see little, little buds in there. And those little buds uh, are meristematic cells, and uh, they, they may or may not grow depending on what kind of buds they are. Uh, a good example of this is uh, people who plant trees, particularly crab apples, anything from the prunus family, so the plums and cherries, apples. Um, those things tend to sucker from underground, yes. right? And they start making a new stem where they're not supposed to. Well, what that is, is meristematic cells that are underground, either on the root or on the, the trunk part of the tree, and they just start growing. And they're saying, I don't know what I'm going to be, but whatever reason, I'm going to turn into a tree. And they start growing and you get this sprout, right? which is a real pain to gardeners. Um, so those are all meristematic cells. And, and what this means is that I can cut a piece of plant off and it regrows, right? So but you have to cut it in the right spot. So if you take a, a stem, for instance, and I cut the stem off, the tip of the stem doesn't regrow because these cells don't exist there. But if you go down the stem to the, the last branch or the last leaf, there are meristematic cells in there and they start to grow. And that's that bud that then takes over. Right? Yes. So if we take an evergreen tree and we, we chop the top off, where we made the cut, you don't get any growth there. Yes, but if you go down to the next the, the next lower branch, that starts to make a new stem and a, yes. and a new leader for that tree. Yes, in fact, usually what happens it makes three or four, and then they have to compete with each other. Yes, and uh, if if you're taking care of your trees, you'll cut most of them off except one. If you don't do that, then you get like four growing, and then they compete with each other, and either you get a really lopsided tree, or eventually one of those will win. Yes. <laughs> And uh, the other place this is really important is in roots. So if you think about it, when we transplant something, we, we cut all the root tips off. Okay, this plant now has, has no root tips. It has the, some roots in the center part, but all the root tips, which is where the growth happens, you cut them off with the shovel. And we pop this into the ground somewhere and it starts to grow and it makes new roots. And the reason is it has these meristematic root cells in various parts, and they just start growing and turn into new roots. Yes, very and handy. <laughs> for the most part, animals and insects and, and higher order organisms can't do that, right? Yes. Just don't have those cells available. Right. Yeah, and I guess it's, I mean, they're different anyway, I suppose. And I guess you have the salamander tail. Uh, <laughs> but, there, you know. Yeah, there are some examples. Um, you know, some of uh, the lizards, they, they will regrow the, the, the tail. The tail, just the tail. But, but you can't cut off their foot and it, oh. it won't regrow, right? It's, yeah. So there are some exceptions. But for, as a general statement, we, we are not really good at doing that. Yeah, well, and I mean, we're, we're different. You know, like, yeah, it's different. And we're, I guess we have, you know, yeah, we just have a completely different life cycle. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, there's tomatic cells. All right, so that's the mm -hmm. basic section. Um, and now we're going to get into roots. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think I just want to make sure there's one thing I wanted to discuss. And I think it was probably in the basics. Uh, you had a great analogy in the book about an experiment a guy did where he... Uh, had a plant he stuck a tree i think in a container yeah th this was an experiment that was done several hundred years ago okay uh, this is you know so this is back when people knew very little about how these things grow so he, he took a small seedling tree put it in a pot and he weighed the soil 
exactly. So he knew how much soil it had. And then all he did was add distilled water. So no fertilizer, no, nothing else was ever added. No minerals, no nothing. No minerals, nothing. So the tree had to grow out of this soil and he grew it for, I don't know, 10 years or something. And then at the end of the 10 years, he had this big tree and he weighed the tree and he also weighed the soil in the pot. Yeah. And of course, what you would expect is that a lot of the weight of the soil disappeared and went into the tree. And that's not what happened. The weight of the soil after 10 years was almost the same as it was when you started. Yes. So where did the weight of this tree come from? And, uh, you know, it may be surprising at first, but when you think about it, it, it makes total sense. Well, most of that weight came from the carbon that the tree absorbed through photosynthesis. Air. Air, basically. <laughs> Air. So it's sucking CO2 in during photosynthesis. And CO2 is the main component of, you know, woody tissue, of, of green tissue, the sugars, the starches. Almost everything inside a plant has lots of carbon in it. Yes. Right? And... I think this, this concept now is so important for us to understand, given the problems we have with climate change and the environment and so on. Um, that carbon that goes into the trees is no longer in the air. It's, it's in a tree form. So it's taken out of the air and, and no longer contributes to global warming. Yes. Because right? it's a tree. And that's why these forests are so important. When yes. we cut down a tree and, and we, we burn that wood, we, we turn that carbon back into CO2. Yeah. Right. Um, now, the interesting thing is that a lot of people say that these forests, these mature forests, are great for helping our climate change because they're sucking in all this CO2. But that actually is not true. So if we take a mature forest, Trees are always dying. And as they die and decompose, they release CO2 back into the air. In a mature forest, the amount of wood is kind of constant, right? New trees grow and, and they absorb CO2 and they're absorbing it, but the old trees are dying and they're releasing it. So you reach a steady state where the forest isn't really absorbing more CO2. Mm. Uh, what is important is when we take, um, you know, non agricultural make, land yes. and we turn it back to forest. Yes. Now we've got 200 years of sucking carbon into those trees, right? So that yes. certainly does work for climate change. Yeah. No. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I was trying to find the, I was trying to, I was trying to find the thing because the weight. I don't know if you remember the difference in the weight. Um, it, was, it was. It was. It was staggering. And, you know, it just, you know, it's not like this, uh, this whole getting the carbon out of the, uh, out of the atmosphere is a mystery. <laughs> I just weighed the thing before and I can't find it. Um, but it was like, I don't know, it was something like, it was like 150 pounds. Yeah. And yeah. when it was like 15 pounds at the beginning, so it's like 150 pounds of air carbon, hmm. which when you think about how much air it would have taken to pull that Especially when you consider, like, like if if I'm in a room here, you know, it's like, what is it like, uh, twenty percent oxygen, eighty eighty percent nitrogen, one percent yeah. everything else. That's right. <laughs> you know? yeah. So, you know, it's a seventy nine twenty and one, right? Something like that, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that little one becomes like you know a hundred pounds of tree. Yeah, that's amazing. It the other thing that's really interesting is, is that we, we, a lot of people understand that, that the wood that the tree makes is, has a lot of carbon in it. Um, but there's, there's uh, something else going on that we're, we, we understand better now as, as uh, the scientist community, not so much from the gardening perspective. And, and that is that there's another place a lot of this carbon goes. So what the plant is doing it's creating these sugars and a lot of those are sent down to the roots yes and uh we understood that that's how we get carrots and beets and and, and how plants over winter because they store this sugar down there and that's why sugar maples for instance you know the syrup comes back up in the spring from the roots because that's where the sugar was stored mm. um, but what we 
don't know a lot about is the fact that plants actually exude these sugars out of their roots, right? This is, has to do with another one of those topics on the list, which is the rhizosphere. Yes, so I don't go too far into it. <laughs> no, no. Well, plant, plants take a huge amount of what they're producing in the leaves and actually squeezes it into the soil. Yeah, they, they yeah, exactly yeah. They, they, what they call exudates. So, so exudate. They basically like excrete it into the ground. They just put energy into the ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah, carbon. But a lot of that is carbon. Yeah. And a lot of that carbon then stays in the soil. Right. So this is why uh, simply growing things um, uh, sequesters carbon. It takes it out of the air takes CO2 in that carbon part and puts it into the soil as carbon through the plant, through the photosynthesis and through the root system. And so by growing things, we, we continually add more carbon to the soil. Yes, which is good uh, for many reasons, actually. We'll get into that in the root, se uh, the root section. Uh, or we're in the root section. Um, so <laughs> actually, that's where we're going. Right? Perfect segue. Uh, next chapter is about roots. Um, you first, I mean, just, I guess it's always good, uh, perhaps in my Aristotelian background, but you know, start with uh, your, your, your definition categories. So you talked about there's four types of roots, fibrous, taproot, tuberous, and uh, adventitious, which I, <laughs> I didn't know what that was. So what are those? Let's just run through. I mean, everybody knows what a taproot is, I think, but let's just run through those briefly. Yeah. So um uh, most plants start out making a taproot. So when the seed germinates, uh, that first radical that comes out is, is usually a taproot. Right. And that, that's true of pretty much all plants. Uh, some plants will then become fibrous fairly quickly. And fibrous just means that there's smaller roots that are coming out the side of this taproot. Right. Uh, some plants keep the taproot. So it just gets larger and larger. So a carrot is a good example of that. Right. Um, uh, other tr uh, some of the trees will have a taproot and that grows fairly straight down and it sort of has this one single root that goes down and it's doing it mostly for anchoring itself. That's what I found when I read your book. I thought that was the main thing, like it was getting the most stuff out of that. And you were like, no, that's just a big stick in the ground that keeps the tree from tipping over. And it's all a little, it's almost like a weak it's all the ones that go sideways that are doing all the, you know, water sucking and nutrient sucking. Well, this yeah. is one of those things, you know, I read about for tap. years. You think that was like the main tap, you know, the, the thing that sucks the most stuff up, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, that's what I read about for years. And I believe for years, right? There were two kinds of trees. There are the tap root trees and then the, the fibrous root trees. And uh, you want to plant tap roots because they go straight down and, and they don't interfere with your perennials so much. Well, most of that is nonsense, um, <laughs> as it turns out. So it is true that something like an oak, for instance, will make a big tap root and it will keep that tap root for a number of years. But at a certain point, it starts making these fibrous roots. And where the important part is where it gets its nutrients there is in the top foot of soil doesn't matter if it's a fibrous tree or taproot tree. As once it reaches a certain level of maturity, most of the feeder roots are sitting right at the top of the soil. Right. That's where it's getting its nutrients. And that has all kinds of uh, implications for, for gardeners. Um, you know, there, there are certain perennial plants that people think have, have very deep roots. And so they're mining all these minerals from down here and bringing them up to the surface soil. And it, it turns out that isn't yes. really what happens, right? Um, most of the feeder roots are in the top foot or six inches of soil. And that's, there's a reason for that. That's where the oxygen is. That's where the water is. That's where all the microbes are. And that's where they get their, their nutrients. It's very hard for plants to get nutrients farther down. And there isn't a lot, there isn't a lot down there, you know, like you start, especially where I live, like you're in Ontario where you've got like all this beautiful soil, Gravel. Right? <laughs> you know, here it's like, we got like a, a little six inches of, uh, you know, uh, you know, sort of something resembling soil, then it's just gray stuff, you know, gray stuff and, and granite rocks <laughs> yeah. fire all the way down. 
you know. <laughs> so uh, yeah, even in even in areas that. <laughs> yeah, even in areas that has very deep soil, the plants still get the nutrients higher up. Right? Well, I guess it's, all it's, the microbial activity and all that composting and leaf, all that stuff, you know, like that, you know, the, the turnover is near the surface and yeah. the water is near the surface, I guess, and it's less more. compacted and all that stuff. Yeah, the water and air are critical, right? So and air, yeah. So, you know, we want soil that's like 25% water, 25% air. And the deeper you go, the less air you have. So yes. plants have trouble, the roots have trouble living down there. Right? Yeah. So it all happens at the surface. And so this idea of tap roots, tap root is really just a, uh, a temporary root for trees. Now, you know, some of our vegetables have tap roots. So carrots do make a definite tap root and dandelions have a very definite tap root and so on. Um, but they're shorter lived plants generally. And so they'll, they'll make this for food storage mostly. Right. right. Uh, beets are like that too. Um, so the, the other, um, well, we have the tuberous uh, roots which a lot of people call bulbs. So we have this whole category of different things that grow underground that um, gardeners tend to mix up the terminology. And, and for the most part, it really doesn't matter whether I call this a tuber or a, uh, a root or a stem. Uh, so for instance, a potato, the, the, the spud that develops um, is actually not a root, it's, it's actually a stem. Really? Oh, it's, uh, it's an expanded stem. Right. Even though they, so they call it a tuber, but that's not a tuberous it's, root. It's a stem. It's, it's, it's really, it's really a, a part of the stem. Yeah. Um, it grows I guess that under makes sense because there's these, uh, what are those called? Um, indeterminate potatoes where you can keep adding soil and they'll send out, they'll actually make potatoes. You know, you bury the stems and they send potatoes out. Yeah. So it's actually uh, um, a stem tissue. And yeah. The importance of that is, is not significant as far as gardening goes, right? So definitely, we don't have to worry too much about the different types, but essentially it's a storage vessel for the plant. When things get large like that, it's, it's storing food for future use, and that's what its purpose is. Is a bulb a tuber tuberous root, or is uh, a bulb, bulb a different thing? A, a true bulb is actually a complete plant. Like so a tulip? An, an onion and a tulip are true bulbs. And if you slice them open and look at it with a microscope, you can actually see uh, leaves and stems and roots and every, there's a complete plant inside those. I see. That's the definition of, of, a, um, uh, of a bulb. Right. right. And then we have some called corms, which are, I think, just uh, uh, stems. It's a stem growth, right? So if you cut that open, you, do, you won't have a plant inside. It's just swollen stem. That's right. all you have. Um, so yeah, there, so there are specific botanical definitions for it, all of those. Right, okay. Uh, there was another concept. So, oh, sorry, adventitious. Well, adventitious. So the idea of this is, gets back to that Mary stem idea, right? That we... We need to have some place in the root system for new roots to grow. Now, uh, interestingly, uh, the place that most root growth happens is actually at the root tips, right? So we have this, yes. this big root system and it's got all these things going around and the side branches and so on. But the only place roots really grow is at the tips. And that, that little tip has special cells in there. It has special Mary stems that have not yet been differentiated. So they're just growing as fast as they can. And as they differentiate, they either become root caps, which is the, the tip of the root, or they become things like xylem and phloem, which is a little farther back in the root. Right. But the way the root grows is it, it basically makes more and more cells at the tip. Right. So the root cells, as it grows, they do grow a certain amount, a certain length, but then they stop growing. And the way roots grow is they just put more cells on the tip. Right. Right. Very similar to the shoot of a plant. Right. The, the, right. the, the way a shoot gets taller is it puts more and more cells at the tip. 
Right. It's it's not right. it's it's not going like this. It's it's a it's a cumul it's accruing or whatever the term is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So one of the things that uh, you shouldn't do, but you can do as an experiment is you put a nail in a tree, right, and watch it over years, and the nail never gets any higher. It's not going so up. You, <laughs> you put it in at six feet, and that tree has added twenty feet to its to its height. The nail is still at six feet. Yes. And that demonstrates the fact that the cells that are there at the six foot height never go any higher. It doesn't grow from below. It grows at the tip. Right. right. It's and roots grow the same way. Right. Right. Now, where adventitious roots are important is that if I come along as a gardener and I'm moving my plant and I cut all those root tips off, now I got no place to grow. I mean, you would think the plant dies, but it has these special roots farther back from the tip that will start to grow if the plant loses its root tips yes um, and that's what they're there for they're they're kind of like uh, you know an emergency fund if i lose all the tips and i can't grow roots all then these start to grow and they start forming new root tips farther yes. closer to the center of the plant when you were even in the book you were talking about how if you buy a potted plant um, it's not always the smartest idea to just take it out of the pot, stick it in the ground. Something you actually want to cut the root tips off. Yeah. Uh, can you explain why a gardener want to do that? Sure. So the problem we have with potted plants is that they're usually root bound, right? And what that means is that the roots have grown out and reached the edge of the pot, and now they can't go any further, so they start circling around. Now, if you buy a plant and it's been treated properly in the nursery, you'd never see this. But the reality is that you do see it a lot. So now you've got this, these roots going around and around the, the, just on the inside of the pot. When you take the plant out, you, you, you see them going around and around. Yes. And if you put that in the soil, they will continue to go around and around. They will tend to stay clumped together. They're, they're mm. not designed to go out in the soil. Now, eventually they will but they may just go around and around for a while. So people came up with different ways of solving this. And there's a couple different ways. A lot of people will just slice the root ball. So you actually cut through all those roots, just uh, maybe an inch deep, four cuts, vertical cuts, and that's enough to make the roots start growing out. Uh, but when they actually looked at this uh, scientifically, uh, see, this goes back to the first question we asked is, what is the best way to do this? Because some gardeners, you know, don't cut them. Some people slice them. Some people cut the bottoms off. Some people cut them into cubes and so on. So which is the best way? The only way you can tell is to actually compare them in a scientific study with proper controls and proper measurement of plants. And someone has done this. Yes. And, and it turns out the best way to do this is actually the box cut them. So you you cut down the two sides and then the other two sides. So you basically make four vertical cuts. Right. Uh, you can cut the bottom off as well. So you basically cut all those roots off except what's in the very center. Right. And then they will start to regrow and will grow out into the new soil. Huh. Now, this is more important for trees than it is for perennial plants. And the reason is that trees keep those roots for their entire life. So these circulating roots don't die off. They stay there, but they get bigger and bigger and bigger. And so they will strangle the trunk of a tree eventually. Right. Perennials, on the other hand, tend to um, uh, get rid of their old roots and replace them with new roots. So it's, it's less of an issue there. But even perennials will grow better if you cut those roots. Right, right, right. I yeah. should ask you, since I got you here, because this is something I think a lot of gardeners might not know. Um, like I've planted different apple trees on my, in my garden. Uh, mm -hmm. I've gotten ones from like the hardware store that are, you know, it's like six foot high. It looks, it's basically a tree. And you're like, hey, that's what I want. I want a tree. And it's in a big pot and you stick it in the ground. And then it, you know, almost dies or whatever, or maybe it thrives, right? And then um, a couple of years ago, I got um, a bare root. Um, what's that called? Um, yeah, the short? Uh, just, a whip. That whip. A, whip. Yeah. a bare rooted whip. 
from from uh, show sponsor Vessi Seeds. Stuck that in the ground. So I mean, I took that thing out of the box. I was like, what the hell is this? It was like <laughs> a stick with roots on it and no soil and no nothing. It looked dead, right? Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I, I looked at a whole bunch of different resources and how to plant it. I did it the way that the thing said. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, the thing grew so well, so fast, so vigorously. Yeah. And I'm wondering, I mean, is it is it a better way to go? I mean, I'm, I'm, it's, they're also cheaper, right? I mean, and you think you're behind the eight ball because the thing's only about two feet high when you stick into the ground, but it's so healthy. Um, yeah. What's the advantage of a whip? Or is there an advantage? Maybe I'm just terrible at planting full-size trees and whips are easier. No, there actually, there actually is, a, is a big advantage. One of the problems with these full-size trees is that the top part's full-size, the, but the thing in the pot is is really tiny in, in relation to the top, right? Yes. And so the root growth is really bad on those things. So what you find is that when you plant large ones and little ones, the large one, of course, has a head start, it's taller, it's bigger, but then it goes into sort of a hibernation thing until it can grow a good root system. Right. So it doesn't grow very much for two or three years. In the meantime, the little guys, has the right proportion of top and bottom, both start growing. And usually within about six years, it's caught up to the big one. And after that, it generally grows better than the large one. Oh yeah. So it, it, they are cheaper, they're easier to plant. And in the long run, it's a better choice. Yeah. Okay, for any kind of tree really. Buying larger trees is, is not really a good thing. Um, most people would be better off if, if the nurseries only sold tiny little trees. Right. The problem is nobody would buy them. <laughs> I know they want like, I want an instant tree, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So they buy, they sell the big ones, but if you have a choice, always pick the small one. It will be tinier for a few years, but you know, four five, six years, it'll catch up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Here's another thing. I mean, we're getting into the, you know, garden myth thing, but. Uh, this has to be asked because we're talking about roots. And I don't even think, I, I can't remember if you discussed this or not. Um, bone meal. Because mm. every time I talk to someone, it's all, because, you know, I, I, I work, I work in a big office and people know I'm a garden guy and they'll say, oh, I'm planting this. Should I put some bone meal in there? And I'm like, no. Um, <laughs> but everyone asks me, like, it's, yeah. it's like everyone believes in bone meal. Yeah. So why? You, so, you said this before on my show, but why <laughs> is it not worth uh, your while to put bone meal? Or, and in what, in what instance might it might it be worth your while? Again, we come back to this uh, business idea: do you, do you listen to the gardening guys or do you listen to science? Right? <laughs> and I always like going back to the science. And if you listen to the gardening guys, yeah, they'll tell you put bone meals in. Particularly, if you're planting bulbs, you got to put bone meal in, and so on. So go back to the science. First question is, what is bone meal? Well, there's some calcium in there and there's a fair amount of phosphorus considering uh, if you compare bone meal to other things, it has a high level of phosphorus. Okay. So those are the two nutrients you're adding. So the next question is, does my soil need either of those two? Okay, if the answer is no, then bone meal is not gonna do you any good, right? Unless you have either a calcium deficiency or a phosphorus deficiency, bone meal does not help and that gets to one of these other things that i think gardeners really have to start understanding is is that you don't fertilize plants you don't feed plants what we do is we replace the missing nutrients in soil and once you understand that concept it changes a lot of things in gardening so the question is is your soil deficient in phosphorus now if it is then bone meal will add phosphorus right? If it's deficient in calcium, which is very rare, it will add calcium. But unless you have those two deficiencies, there's no point in adding bone meal. Now right. with bulbs, there's a second problem in that it also attracts rodents and dogs and so on, and they tend to dig up where you just planted your bulbs. So that's a good reason not to put it there, even if you do need phosphorus. Right, right. So we have to come back and understand why we're adding this stuff. And right. I think once you do that, it makes so much sense to you that you wouldn't add that. 
I mean, I've never used bone meal in my life. <laughs> right. I, you yeah. don't need it. Not, not around here. We have phosphorus and calcium in our soil. Right. Um, and in fact, um, most soil has lots of phosphorus. I mean, that's another whole program. But understanding why plants may not be able to get enough of it is, is a different question. But soil rarely has a phosphorus deficiency. And right. too much phosphorus can be harmful to your plants and your soil. So, uh, you know, get rid of the bone meal. I mean, you right. don't need it. Right. Uh, okay. Well, you, you sold me. I mean, that was already, I'm, I'm so cheap. I never bought it in the first place. I thought, well, <laughs> how about I just stick plant it and see what happens? Um, but I might have been one of those people if I was always planting stuff and they, they didn't do well. I might would think it was bone meal when it could be a thousand other things like yeah. the, water, the soil's too wet or whatever right <laughs> well that's that's where these these uh, stories come from right if you've always used bone meal when you planted things and you've always had a great garden you believe in bone meal yes right? but as a gardener you've never actually tested it you have yes. never had two gardens one with and one without so <laughs> you have no reason to believe it's bone meal yes <laughs> exactly um okay now there's the other thing about uh, the roots and uh you know, I guess we're talking about perennials um, and and uh, well, perennials. Yeah, I guess there's another category, but we'll get into that later. Um, fall and winter growth of roots. I mean, what's what's going on in the fall? The, the plants look like they're dying in the fall. Let's talk about an, an apple tree for an example, right? Plant looks like it's dying, but there's something happening in fall. And in the winter, it looks like it's just dead. Um, there can also be something happening in the winter. So what's what's going on in a plant that appears dormant? Um, what's going on in the roots of a plant that is dormant, going into dormancy in fall and being dormant in the winter? Okay. So the first thing to understand is uh, when do roots grow? And uh, I mean, plants will grow roots whenever they really need to. But for the most part, most root growth happens when it's cooler. So middle of summer, roots are mostly dormant. They're not doing a lot of growing. If you're in a really cold climate in the middle of winter in January, February, even the soil gets too cold and they're not growing either. But when we're looking at spring and fall, uh, we have cool temperatures above and we have cool temperatures in the soil, but they're not too cool. And that's when roots grow really well. So a plant, you know, July, August, roots aren't doing much. The top part may be flowering, growing, doing its thing. Roots are kind of dormant. Now we get into September, October, the temperature's coming down. That's when roots start to grow. And they like that cooler temperature. Right. And they will continue growing until the ground gets too cold, um, which is just a little bit above freezing usually. Right. But they grow much longer than we think. And that's one of the reasons why it's really important to water newly planted things right up until the ground freezes. Right. right. You don't stop in in end of August when when the, the temperatures are cooling down outside because the roots are still growing. They need that moisture. Right. right. Now, the top part of the plant, if we're looking at a deciduous woody tree, like uh, an apple tree, for instance, uh, the, kind of the opposite is, is going on there, right? It starts growing in spring. That's when it leafs out. It makes all these leaves. And by middle summer, it's, it's not visually growing anymore because the leaves are fully developed, right? The apples are on the tree. I mean, the apples may still be getting a little bigger and a little riper, but the tree doesn't seem to be doing very much at this point. But in fact, it is. And again, this will depend on the type of tree it is. But a lot of trees in July and August are developing next year's buds, right? right. So the leaves are photosynthesizing. They're taking those sugars. They're sending them down to the roots for next year. They're going through a hardening off process. So all the cells in the stems are slowly changing and getting harder and harder. Uh -huh. um, Right. Nutrients are being sucked out of the leaves. Now we're now maybe September, right? And that's why our leaves turn red and yellow in the fall. The green goes away because the plant is actually taking some of those nutrients out of the leaves and storing it in stems and roots. 
So there's a lot of things going on there. It's there's a lot of chemical changes going on that we we don't see, but it's getting ready for winter. Uh, it reduces the amount of moisture in the cells because if there's too much moisture in there and they freeze, they're going to crack. Right? It it increases the amount of sugar in the, each of the cells um, because the sugar acts like antifreeze. Right. So these cells don't freeze as easily as clean, pure water would. Right? Mm. So there's a lot of internal things going on, including the development of all these buds. And so it's really getting ready for next spring. It's, it goes through this process, July, August, September, which uh, really says, okay, let me get ready for spring. What do I have to do? How do I have to change to survive the winter? Right. right. And, and that's just when these, these roots start to really take off and, and grow. I, and then middle of winter, January, most things are pretty dormant. Uh, so deciduous trees won't be doing much of anything, but they're still active. Metabi they still have metabolism going on. They're still breathing. They're still using up that energy to stay alive in the wintertime. So they're never 100% dormant. Right, right. Mm -hmm. It's just more like in science fiction where the guy's in the glass jar and for the yeah. long space flight to the, you know, Alpha Centauri planet. And, you know, it's it, 10 years goes by and he, he's ready to get in a fist fight mm -hmm. the minute he comes out of the little tube. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, I should ask you, I, I moved uh, that very whip. So that very whip, I decided this fall was in the wrong place. And I wanted to move it, move all my apple tree, move everything. I did a major reorganization of the garden. Viewers are going to show you what's the situation. Uh, I've already filmed the video. I just got to edit it and put it up. Put up. Garden looks a lot different. Um, anyway, so I had this beautiful sweet 16 apple tree that I grew from a whip um, that was, you know, seven feet high now, two feet high a few years ago. Healthy, beautiful tree. Got apples this year great variety so i had a buddy come over and we dug all the way we basically went at about two feet from the from the base all the way around with a sharp shovel and the two of us just grabbed it and ripped it right out of the ground mm -hmm. um and whatever wouldn't come out we ah, cut right mm -hmm. um now and then we we you know made a hole and dug it and packed it down really good and put it in another spot now after i moved this and i moved this one in mid late October okay so all the maple trees everything in the forest with the full forest was yellow and red everything's been changing but my apple tree was still green and I was worried that if I waited too long to move it there wouldn't be good root development before the winter and also the guy that was helping me that's that's the afternoon he you know that's when he yeah. could help me right I couldn't like, you know, if I waited two weeks, he might not be available. And I needed like a grown man. I needed someone reasonably strong to help me with this. Right. Um, so I just, he said, oh, I can help you today. And I was like, oh, you know, but then I read afterwards, you should really wait till the plants leaves have started to not necessarily fall on, but at the very least they've lost their color and that sort of stuff. So I wonder, did I kill my, like how much damage did I, basically the, the, the leaves were green and I moved it and the leaves died. And to a large extent, the leaves are still on that tree dead. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm examining the buds because I don't know if I killed the, you know, I'll know next spring because the buds, well, actually I'll know pretty soon. You know, you can sort of tell by the state of buds if they're alive or dead. Yeah. Um, yeah. What do you yeah. think? It, it's, I, I think the tree would be fine. Okay. Um, so it is always on deciduous plants is always better to wait until the leaves drop off. Uh, but I think you're far enough along in the season that it probably doesn't make a lot of difference. Right. Might um, have a crappy year next year. You, you know, you can, they're pretty resilient. And so if they lose a few weeks or a month of, of, you know, green leaves, that's not going to bother it very much. Um, the one thing you can do with moving particularly larger trees is to actually cut the roots in the fall and then move them in the spring. What? That works very well. So uh, your, your tree now is like seven feet tall. 
So it has a root system that's going out into the soil, you know, seven feet in every direction. Not anymore. And <laughs> you cut a lot of those off. Yes. Right. So most of its roots are gone. So one of the things that works really well is that you come along and you figure out where your root ball is going to be. And you don't dig the whole root ball, but you, you dig, you, you take the spade and, and press it down in a few spots where the root ball is going to be. And so you cut like half the roots. So half of them are still long going out doing their thing, but the other half you've cut off. And then you leave the plant there all winter and wait till spring. So it starts regenerating new root tips near the center of the root ball. And then next year you come along and cut the other roots off. So now you have some, uh, you know, long roots that you cut off, but half the roots are short and they have new root tips already. Uh, They're ready to go. Short and bushy sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that, I've tried that a number of times and that really works quite well. Oh. Uh, now the other common advice that you get, which is wrong, is that you've cut a whole bunch of roots off. So now the root ball is small, the top part's still big. You should cut the top part off to kind of mirror the bottom part. Right. right. And that's advice that used to be around a lot and is still around quite a bit. You should never do that. Really? You know, dig it up, move it. The plant will figure out if it's got too much top growth right. and it will lose some of it. So in your case, what it said was, geez, I, I just lost all my roots. I can't support these green leaves because the roots have to provide water and nutrients for these leaves to work. So it said, okay, well, let's get rid of the leaves and they turn brown, right? So the plant is able to figure that out. If it needs to, a few of the branches may die back, right? What's and the, the plant will abort those if it needs to. Let the plant make that decision instead of you as a gardener saying, oh, I think I'll cut one third off and, and balance the root size. What's the risk of cutting it off? You cut off the wrong part. Like there was a, there was a, better, there was a better branch to sacrifice that the plant could have determined to the, sacrifice or? The, 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 the risk the is that you don't need to cut any off. It will just be fine anyways. Oh. <laughs> right? So you've cut this thing back, even though it doesn't need to be cut back. The other thing that I think, I never realized, and actually until I read the book, I think, or a few years before I wrote the book, um, is that we, we talk about these plants taking all its energy and sugars and sending them down to the roots for the winter, but that's not actually what happens. Some is sent down there, but an awful lot of that is stored in the woody parts that are above ground. Mm. All those stems and trunks and everything, they're full of sugars. Right? Almost like our beer belly. And, <laughs> yeah, like a beer belly, right? Yes. So every time you cut one of those branches off, you're actually taking resources, food away from the plant. Resources. Right? So the recommendation now is just leave the top part and let the plant decide on what it needs to do, and, and they'll figure it out as they go along. Huh. Wow. Well, okay, well, that's, <laughs> that's cool. We actually did remove... Uh, a, a sizable branch from the now that branch uh due to an injury it, it was basically ringed with the bark yeah. was wrecked all the way around uh -huh. so we said well i might as well just take this off anyway it's screwed anyway right um, yeah no, it was no, a that's... sizable they sent basically the central leader <laughs> lost yeah. Yeah. um and i thought well you know we've screwed the roots up so much uh it's probably too much tree anyway um yeah. and i also thought you know i mean it had to go anyway because we basically ringed it um, from, from another injury, but also it made the tree less, um, there's a lot of wind here, right? We got hurricanes, yeah. right? So I thought, well, the tree will be less likely to blow down. And actually that tree had blown sort of, it already been picked back up. <laughs> what, what'll happen is we'll get a hurricane. And I mean, the wind is a problem, but what, what really happens is that there's so much rain, the soil gets so soft that the, the, the tree just, there's almost nothing holding it in. Yeah. You know, because the soil just becomes this unbelievably soft thing. And, um, and it's not very deep. It's it's basically like a skin on top of stones, right? And yes. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. it's not, you know, it's the combination of the intense wind and just everything, you know, you're getting some insane amount of rain in a very short amount of time. And it's just the ground so unbelievably soft. You can, I mean, I remember um, when I was first making my garden, 
uh, I, I incorporated a lot of large granite rocks from there's a hill next to the garden and just big, big rocks, you know, rocks the size of two basketballs all over the place. Mm. Right. But I would always go out after a good rain to get them out of the ground because it'd be like one one eighth of the rock sticking out. Yeah. And you just go there with a pickaxe and try to get them out. Well, if it had just rained really good, they'll come right out as long as you're reasonably strong. But if you go out there in like uh, the middle of August, um, <laughs> it's, it's yeah, like mining it's... coal, right? <laughs> it's not coming out. <laughs> yeah. um, all right. Actually, man, we, we've talked a lot. Let's um, maybe we'll actually, geez, we're only in a chapter two here. This is unbelievable. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, let's talk about the rhizosphere and see how much time we have left sphere. after that, because that's okay. a game or rhizosphere. I, I always pronounce things the wrong way, but this is probably the most, I mean, we could do a whole podcast on that. Uh, yeah, you the could. Uh, um, the rhizos, I think it's rhizosphere. I'm not I, have to go rhizo, look it up. I like rhizosphere. Um, <laughs> but uh, let's talk about this is something that I think a lot of gardeners, either they haven't heard of it, or they've got a sort of magical understanding of it, perhaps. Mm. Um, but this is probably one of the more fascinating things about plants. And you discussed it a little, you, you hinted, you teased us a little bit about the sugars mm. going into the ground, that sort of thing. But mm. there's even more going on there than uh, than one might think. Yeah, there's even more going on than in my plant book. And I'll <laughs> be putting that section into my micro book. Ah. Um, it, the, the rhizosphere, it's, it's a fairly... A new topic for science now right. by new you know we're, we're talking 30 years old and they've been researching it for quite a while but they still a big mystery of most of what goes on so the rhizosphere is a thin layer and we're talking like millimeters around the roots right so it's a right. very thin area of soil around these roots and that area is completely different than the rest of your soil and I think that's the, one of the things for uh, gardeners to understand. You're talking about the soil that's right next to the roots. Right. Basically, that, that crumb of soil that's almost touching the, the root. Yeah. And there's this very thin, thin layer around the root that's completely different. And the story, the story sort of sound, starts with the plant. So the plant says, you know, um, I like fungi, mycorrhizal fungi. Because those fungi, they go out and they get water and phosphorus and bring it back to the root and they make my life easier. So how do I get these fungi? And this is the plant talk. Yes. And the plant says, well, you know, I've got all these sugars here. And if you know something about fungi, you know, they don't photosynthesize. Fungi don't have any green parts, so they can't make their own sugar. They have to get the energy from somewhere else, just like you and I. So the plant takes some of these sugars and they can take up to 30% of the material they make in the leaves and they literally squeeze it out the roots. So now we have all this sugar around the root and the fungi come along and they notice that and they attach to the roots and the, the way mycorrhizal fungi uh, attach, they actually burrow right into the root. So these two things are joined together. And the plant keeps giving these guys sugar and the fungi go out and get water and phosphor and bring it back to the roots. So the plant needs a much smaller root system for this. It becomes an efficient way of getting particularly phosphorus. Right. Um, well, that's an interesting story. But now we've got all this sugar around this root and, and who loves sugar? Well, all kinds of microbes, particularly bacteria. So these bacteria come along and they live around this root. And the concentration of bacteria in this space can be a thousand times higher than anywhere else in the soil. So it's, it's like downtown Toronto, you know, the streets are full of people walking there. It's really crowded. Right. And uh, so, but that's beneficial for plants too. These, these microbes that are living there actually compete with pathogens. So we now know the plant is encouraging certain types of microbes to live there and they actually have different kinds of exudates and exudates are just a fancy name for chemicals so they they squeeze out different kinds of chemicals to attract the bacteria they want to live there and they keep pathogens away right, right. and the interesting thing i find is that the plant controls all this 
right. to a certain extent. Right. Uh, as it turns out, now we know a little bit more, and the fungi also control some of this. But to a great extent, the, the plant decides if it's going to do this. If we take a plant and we you put mean it, it doesn't in, just do it one way. It basically dials mm -hmm. this up or dials that down depending on yeah. what it needs. Yeah. Yeah. So if we if we take this same plant and we put it into a pot and we put in a whole bunch of bone meal, so now it's got all kinds of phosphorus. It says, "Hey, I don't need to give up my sugars to the fungi because I don't need the fungi. There's mm -hmm. enough fertilizer in this pot that I'll just use the fertilizer directly." Oh. So you don't get these associations. Oh. So the type of microbes that are there and the degree in which these things work together depends on the plant and it can make decisions of whether it wants these things or not. Uh, but there's a couple other things that happen. One is that it also exudes uh, different types of organic acids and that acidifies the soil. Mm -hmm. The other thing that happens is that as, as we breathe and, and, you know, microbes are no different than us. We're, we're breathing, we're taking in oxygen and producing CO2. When CO2 is put into water, it's acidic, right? That's why the rain that falls down is always acidic because it picks up CO2 as it's going through the air, it becomes acidic. And by the time it hits the ground, it's acidic. Mm. Well, now we have this area around the roots that's very acidic. And it can have a pH of two units lower than the soil around it. Really? And that answers a question that I've had for, for many, many years. If you look at the availability of nutrients in soil based on pH, you learn very quickly that plants shouldn't grow above seven. Because above seven, a lot of these nutrients are tied up. The plants shouldn't be able to get them. But they do. Lots of plants grow in, in alkaline soil. Well, it turns out that the soil out here is alkaline, but the soil right around the root is acidic. Right. Because the plant has conditioned that soil to be more acidic. Right. And if it's more acidic, they have an easier time to get nutrients. It's got almost like a little force field. That's <laughs> around the roots. <laughs> it's, a, it's this little area around the roots that... Right is under the control of the plant to a great extent, right? Gives it more nutrients, gives it um, uh, water and phosphorus from the fungi, keeps pathogens away. This is great for the plant. It doesn't have to work so hard, except it does have to photosynthesize and make all of these compounds. And yes. that's really the thing that we have to understand is that all these other things in the soil, all these microbes and fungi and so on, they can't make their own sugars. They can't make food. They can't make either nitrogen or the carbon. Uh, they have to get that from the plants, particularly the carbon. A few of them can make nitrogen, but most of them can't make that either. So the carbon is what comes from the plants and that comes from photosynthesis and that goes into the microbes. And, and that's why we have so much carbon in that soil too, because we have all these microbes they are eating the sugars, then they're dying, then we have dead bodies, which is essentially compost. So we have this little compost pile around the roots that's releasing nutrients that attracts more microbes. They eat that compost, they get some sugars from the plant, they grow even bigger, and this whole thing goes along. The other thing that's kind of interesting is that most of this happens at the root tip or just a little bit back from the root tip. Right. So as the root grows, all, all these microbes kind of follow the root tip. Oh, I see. Right? Right, right, right. You don't find them on the old roots, you find them at the tips. So okay. a couple inches back from the, the root tip is where all this explosion of microbes is taking place. And as oh. the root gets a little longer, they, they either die off or they migrate with the root, depending on the type you're of saying, microbe. Are you saying the rhizosphere is, is really just at the root tips? It's really not it, like all the roots aren't necessarily... It's in... mostly near the root tips. I see. Yeah, okay. because the, if we move back from the root tips, the roots don't do much. So, for instance, we, we talk about roots absorbing water, right? Well, that's actually not quite correct. Roots actually don't absorb water. What? It's the, the root hairs is what absorbs the water. Okay. And you only find root hairs at the root tip. I see. Okay. You don't find them. If you take a, a normal root and you go back three or four inches, you don't find any root hairs. 
Uh, okay, they're constantly growing and being regenerated right near the root tip. Water travels up that root, but it's water not absorbing travels it. up it. That's so it. the root tip is where all the action is. It's where all the water gets absorbed. It's where all the nutrients get absorbed. And that old root now is just a tube to connect it to the rest of the plant. I see. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I was first, you know, became aware of of how how much a plant can do if it has good sun and enough water and not much else. Um, I had a, when I first bought this house, the driveway was gravel. And part of the driveway, the, the side of the driveway where the ho house faces south, right against the house, south facing in the gravel, there was always weeds growing there. I mean, just always things growing there, dandelions or whatever, right? The rest of the driveway was basically barren. But that warm, sunny spot, always growing weeds. And uh, so I think year two of, of living here, um, I just made holes in the gravel and stuck like sage and thyme and <laughs> oregano right in the driveway. Yeah. And then I put a little box around it and actually covered it with sand so it would be weed free. Uh, and those plants are still growing there. I mean, they basically... <laughs> Because I mean, what's happening? And also, when I, you know, you know, like when you dig up into the gravel, there'd be worms in the gravel, mm -hmm. you know, because there's a bit of soil in there, right? Yeah. But I mean, according to what you're saying, those plants are basically squirting all the sugar into the yeah. driveway, <laughs> and that's attracting all these things. I mean, I'm sure they're not as vigorous and as amazing as they could potentially be in, in perfect soil, but I mean, I've got I've got all the time and oregano and savory uh and and rosemary a guy could possibly want um <laughs> growing out of this gravel driveway <laughs> yeah well if, if you think back to that experiment with the tree right they they yes. only need a very very small amount of nutrients and the rest of it is water and co2 from the air and that's and what sun. makes these things grow and sun of course yeah, the energy yeah. from the sun yeah. but the amount of nutrients these plants take up is 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 tiny tiny amounts yeah. Uh, it's just amazing um okay well you know what it's i've kept you for like an hour and a half so i think even though we're only we've only gotten to chapter two i think i think we got to call it quits and we'll get into uh stems and leaves and the whole plant and flowers and all that sort of stuff for the next uh next installment of this uh we'll, we'll bring you back um well whenever you're able to come back um but uh yeah robert this has been great and uh i can't believe uh we only got through two chapters of your book. And I mean, we're just doing like, it's not like I'm going line by line. This is just a little smattering um, from that book. Um, there's just so much there, right? Um, but uh, well, thank, anyway. Well, thanks. thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. No, Appreciate thanks for it. coming. And uh, I can't wait to have you back again to sort of finish. We'll have to have you back before uh, your other book comes out. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, can you can, can you come back in? Uh, like, well, I guess the next one, this one's coming out the 1st of hey, December. I, I'm retired, so I'm pretty flexible. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, okay, people, then uh, look forward to uh, the uh, beginning of January. We'll have Robert back again to discuss. Uh, I'll try to figure out some way to do the rest of the book without getting so deep I into try. it. <laughs> but you know what, the roots, I mean, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's, I mean, you could, you could have a whole book called Root Science, I'm sure. Uh, oh, I'm sure you could. <laughs> don't, don't, don't give me any ideas, right? Um, <laughs> all right, well, Robert, thanks for being on the show. Uh, really appreciate it. Can't wait to have you on again. Uh, everybody out there, uh, check out that book. Um, I'll, I'll put a link to uh, Robert's uh, website and, uh, you know, a link to, or you can send me just, you know, uh, how to get it, buy it on Amazon. Is that the best place to get yeah, it? Yeah, probably the best place is Amazon. Amazon. Yeah, I, I can't, sh shipping costs too much for me and uh, it's, you're going to get better service from Amazon. So, <laughs> <laughs> And your, your next book, uh, which you said was? Co compost Science. Compost Science. That's coming out in a few weeks. It's, I should have it before Christmas. Oh, so, so uh, it is on Amazon. Bookstores everywhere. You you can pre-order from Amazon. I, oh. I don't think they're shipping yet because I generally get one of the first copies. Ah, I see. So if you order it for Christmas, you may not get it till January, but ah. you can pre-order it. 
I'll have to ask uh, Santa for a copy of that. Um, no, I, I'm a guy with a beard and a red hat that I'm looking at right now. Uh, <laughs> I, I will be getting you one as soon as I can. Okay. <laughs> great. All right, Robert. Great to have you on the show, everybody out there. Uh, until next time, get out there, get at it, have fun in your garden. Thanks for right. watching. Thanks. See you again, me. everyone. <laughs> Hey folks, want to help support everything I'm doing here? Check out my sponsors, Vessi's Seeds and Safer's Gardening Products. For Vessi's, go to their website, Vessi's.com. Uh, for Safer's Products, Woodstream Products, you can buy all the things I use in my garden, Slug and Snail Killer, BTK, and all. You can buy that from Vessi's, or you can go to their websites uh, for a much wider range of products to solve just about any kind of problem that you can imagine uh, with high quality natural ingredients like oils from seeds and flowers and stuff like that. Uh, for, if, you, if you're in Canada, go to woodstreambrands.ca, and as long as your order is over $69, you get free shipping. If you're in the United States of America, then go to saferbrand.com, and as long as your order is over $45 US, you'll get free shipping from them. So yeah, if you want to help support the channel and the podcast, and they sell something you need, buy it from them, and that'll help support everything I'm doing here. Thanks a lot.